that they've shut those doors. Go for it, sir. This hearing of the Committee on Oversight and Accountability will come to order. I want to welcome everyone here. Without objection, the chair may declare a recess at any time. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. I want to welcome everyone to this hearing before the Committee on Oversight. In recent years, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI initiatives, have become a divisive subject in U.S. businesses, educational institutions, state legislatures, and here in Congress. Unfortunately, many of these initiatives, which many assume simply promote equal opportunity, have in some cases become integrated into employment practices to a point where the civil rights of employees are violated. DEI in some forms means preferencing racial categories and disfavoring other racial categories. It's discrimination with a fancy acronym. Racial discrimination is wrong, it's immoral, and it's illegal in the employment context. Next Tuesday, July 2nd, we will celebrate the 60th anniversary of the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 into law. Title VII of that law makes it an unlawful employment practice to discriminate in hiring or against employees once on the job because of their race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. When employers systematically implement employment practices that discriminate on the basis of race, it doesn't matter that it's dressed up in a fancy acronym like DEI. The law says that's illegal racial discrimination. And it's illegal whether the victim of that discriminatory, discriminatory practice is white, black, Native American, or any other racial category. All one needs to do is review the disclosures of many Fortune 500 companies to witness the implementation of literal racial quotas in hiring and promotion. Hiring managers and executives are encouraged by their companies to institute hiring quotas on the basis of race or face cuts to their compensation or incentives. Can you imagine the disgust of those who crafted the Civil Rights Act to find out that 60 years later, some of the largest and wealthiest companies are still not just implementing, but publicly celebrating the racial discrimination at their companies? State attorneys general have called out companies advancing such discriminatory practices, such as, quote, explicit racial quotas and preferences in hiring, recruiting, retention, promotion, and advancement, end quote. They also have recognized those practices to include, quote, race-based contracting practices, such as racial preferences and quotas in selecting suppliers, providing overt preferential treatment to customers on the basis of race, and pressuring contractors to adopt the company's racially discriminatory quotas and preferences, end quote. I will enter the Attorney General July 13, 2023 letter into the record with unanimous consent without objection, so ordered. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, the federal agency responsible for enforcing federal laws against illegal racial discrimination and harassment in all types of work situations, should stand up for the rule of law and investigate such practices at U.S. companies. The EEOC should, should also reiterate the plain language of Title VII, prohibiting racial discrimination in everything it does through guidance, public statements, data collection, litigation, or otherwise. Yet under the Biden administration, the EEOC has demonstrated a pattern of public activity inconsistent with the law. And when presented with evidence of discriminatory practices at companies, the EEOC appears to have taken no action at all. In the worst cases, EEOC appears to have filed amicus briefs actually defending the ability of companies to engage in racially discriminatory practices. We are encouraged that EEOC Commissioner Andrea Lucas has been outspoken in support of the law, arguing correctly that the Title VII is violated if race was at all part of the motivation for an employment decision. On March 1, 2024, I wrote the EEOC along with the subcommittee chairman, Pat Fallon from Texas, seeking a briefing and documents and information to conduct oversight of this matter. Since that time, I've been alarmed as, as well with EEOC redefining sex discrimination through guidance in a way that will jeopardize the rights of men and women in the workplace. On April 29, 2024, the EEOC issued an updated workplace harassment enforcement guidance, its first since 1999. 
This includes new language requiring employers to permit male employees to use female changing areas and bathrooms. Now, many states immediately sued the EEOC after the issuance of the new guidance on the grounds of government overreach, and those states seek injunctions to prevent its implementation. EEOC Commissioner Lucas has called out the new guidance for effectively eliminating single-sex workplace facilities in addition to intruding on the right of freedom of speech and belief. Thank you to the witnesses appearing here today, and I now yield to Ranking Member Ocasio-Cortez for her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Throughout history, Americans have fought for and championed civil rights. We fought to end segregation, discrimination, and advance measures towards an integrated, diverse, multiracial society. And throughout our history, we have also had to confront the ugly legacy and backlash of bigotry, ignorance, and white nationalism. The arguments that protections and civil rights for historically marginalized populations as quote unquote reverse racism or preferential is not new. We passed the Civil Rights Act and Economic Opportunity Act in 1964. The United States passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, the Fair Housing Act in 1968, and spent decades afterwards integrating schools, all in an effort to build a society where people can work and be treated equally, no matter their race, gender, religion, or sexual orientation. But throughout it all, from Little Rock to Charlottesville to today, extremists have resisted these efforts to integrate American democracy. They weaponize fear and claim these efforts towards a better society are themselves unjust, unconstitutional, or illegal. Today's hearing is just the latest in a decades-long attack from, from right-wing extremists on any and all efforts to expand civil rights, equity, and freedom in the United States. Let's start with the Civil Rights Act, which is designed to ensure no person is discriminated against for something as simple as the color of their skin, their gender, or their religion. Before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was even passed, conservative anti-integrationists opposed it. Arguing that, arguing that the law would somehow violate their constitutional right to segregated spaces. But they lost that fight. And thanks to the landmark legislation of the 1960s, opportunities for black Americans radically expanded. From 1959 to 1969, the poverty rate for black Americans dropped nearly in half. The share of black youth completing high school rose from 39% to, to 56%, and the gap between white and black incomes reached the lowest it had ever been, all after integrationist pro-civil rights policies were passed. Then came the, the conservative response afterwards. In the late 60s, Republican President Richard Nixon, determined to gain support from Southern white politicians by appealing to racism, promised to slow the civil rights, promised to slow civil rights enforcement. In the 1970s, right-wing opponents of civil rights and integration started framing efforts to ensure all Americans have equal, equal access to opportunities as quote unquote reverse racism. And in the 1980s, Republicans and right-wing judges, including now Chief Justice John Roberts, built on that framing to advance a dubious argument. If we don't talk about bigotry, it doesn't exist. So instead of punishing bigoted leaders and organizations and societal structures in violation of the law and working to create a more equitable world, the law would instead pretend race and racism and their real world impacts didn't exist. This right-wing legal effort continues today. One lawyer alone, Edward Blum, Blum backed by wealthy right-wingers, right, white, right has brought more than two dozen cases since the 1990s attempting to remove consideration of race entirely from key civil rights laws. This resistance to integration in every part of society whether it be in schools or housing or the workforce, is an attempt to destroy the progress we have made toward a more equal and just society. 
but it's also an economic play. And that's what's important for people to understand. This is a way to keep the status quo that gives a handful of the, of the most wealthy people in our society power and immunity and distract the working class from attaining the basic rights and protections we all deserve. These right-wing billionaires prey on racism, bigotry, anti-trans panic, and fear to drive wedges in our communities and prevent resources from going to public services that predominantly serve working class communities. They use these arguments to defund our schools, to defund our communities, and to defund our public infrastructure. They divide us, and they dismantle our public housing, and they union bust. And let's be clear, these extremists are not just destroying the public institutions that working people rely upon as retaliation in some culture war. No, defunding services for working people is the point. And we've seen what happens when they pursue this goal. Last year alone, more than 4,200 books were targeted in right-wing attempts for censorship. Most often targeted for censorship were those books that cover themes related to race, gender, and sexual orientation. Last year, a record 510 anti-LGBTQ bills were introduced in state legislatures. And since the Dobbs decision two years ago this week, 21 states now ban abortion or are more restrictive than the standard was in place under Roe. They opposed, those opposed to integration see all of this as a victory and they are not planning to stop there. Project 2025, the radical right-wing playbook detailing conservative Donald Trump's agenda for a second term, devotes an entire chapter to detailing the many ways that the federal government should roll back progress and turn back the clock on civil rights and liberties in the first place. I will note that the majority of this committee has apparently invited the author of that chapter to testify here today. This hearing is fundamentally an insult to the promise of a multiracial democracy that we all represent and require for prosperity for a working class America. This hearing is fundamentally an insult to all of us. My Republican colleagues are going to say empty words about discrimination in the workplace today. They're going to play on fear and provide yet another opportunity for radical right-wing extremism, the kind that says if you're not white or cisgender or straight or a man, you don't deserve equal rights, protections over your own body, and the ability to have control over your own life to take root. But we're not going to fall for it, and we're not going to let them get away with it. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Today we are joined by the Honorable Todd Rokita, who serves as the Chief Legal Officer of the State of Indiana as their Attorney General. Uh, he previously served Indiana's 4th Congressional District as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from 2011 to 2019. Welcome back. Jonathan Berry is a managing partner of the law firm Boyd & Gray. From 2018 to 2020, he led the U.S. Department of Labor's regulatory office. Additionally, from 2017 to 2018, Mr. Berry served as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General of the U.S. Department of Justice. Inez Stepman is a senior policy and legal analyst for Independent Women's Forum, an organization devoted to enhancing people's freedom, opportunities, and well-being. She is a Lincoln Fellow with the uh, Claremont Institute and a senior contributor to the Federalist. Lastly, Maya Wiley is president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights a coalition with more than 230 members that engages in legislative advocacy. Pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise the right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, uh, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative, and thank you. You all may take a seat. We appreciate you being here today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we have read your written statement and it will appear in full in the hearing record. Please limit your oral statement to five minutes. As a reminder, please press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it's on and the members can hear you. When you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will turn yellow. When the red light comes on, your five minutes is expired and we ask that you please wrap up. I now recognize uh, General Rokita for his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Comer, uh, Ranking Member Ocasio-Cortez, and members of the committee for inviting me to speak here today. It's good to see you. Uh, my name is Todd Rakita, and I'm, I serve as the Attorney General for the State of Indiana, an office where I manage over 400 employees. 
And prior to serving as Indiana's chief legal officer, I spent several years in the private sector as general counsel for a company that served other companies, each having over 100 employees. And before that, as you mentioned, Chair, I served as a member of Congress for eight years as the subcommittee chairman on education and workforce, where I served under many chairmen, including the one here today. So just like then, I'm sure I'll be corrected a few times today as well. <laughs> she does that a lot. <laughs> like I said, it's good to see everybody. Uh, I also had the honor of serving for eight years as Indiana Secretary of State, where I managed the day-to-day -day operations of, of uh, well near 100 employees. So I believe these experiences, in short, give me some unique insights on in how our laws regulate and restrict the use of race and sex in our workplace. You know, the United States was founded on a basic idea, as self-evident today as it was 250 years ago, and that is all men are created equal. That idea is embodied in the 14th Amendment as well, which requires state governments to provide equal protection of the laws to all persons. The Fifth Amendment imposes similar constraints on the federal government. Likewise, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits invidious discrimination in the workplace, advances the goal of equal treatment in the private as well as uh, public sectors. So despite the importance our nation places on equal protection under the law, corporate America and academic institutions have all too frequently embraced the notion, completely at odds uh, with our founding principles, that to remediate racial discrimination of the past, we must somehow engage in racial discrimination now. For decades, that misguided notion was put into practice through affirmative action programs on college campuses. More recently, it has infiltrated workplaces in the form of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, initiatives that have become fashionable in the C-suites of many of America's largest companies. Such racial discrimination ignores the observation that Chief Justice Roberts made back in 2007 that only that the only way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. In other words, eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. And that's exactly what the Supreme Court recently declared in Students for Fair Admissions. In that case, the court held that the admissions programs of Harvard College and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution and civil rights laws because they relied on race to decide which students get admitted. The implications of the decision extend beyond the academic world because picking winners and losers based on race is wrong and illegal in any context. It follows that DEI initiatives in corporate America that require race-based hiring practices are in most, if not all cases, likely violations of Title VII. So that's why last year, I, along with 12 other state attorneys general, sent a letter to Fortune 100 company CEOs reminding them of their obligations under the civil rights laws. In our letter, we stress that these companies cannot discriminate based on race, including taking discriminatory actions under the guise of DEI. As Judge Robert Bork once said, to make a distinction between persons on racial grounds is utterly irrational. That is the bedrock, non-negotiable principle that animates all of our civil rights laws, and there is no DEI exception to that in the Constitution or in Title VII. Our civil rights laws also guarantee the equal treatment of men and women irrespective of sex. In Bostock versus Clayton County, the Supreme Court narrowly extended this principle mistakenly, in my humble view, to hold that employers violate Title VII if they fire or refuse to hire an individual because of sexual orientation or gender identity. Critically, the court's decision only concerned the hiring and firing decisions and declined, specifically declined, to address other issues that employers may encounter. To address some of the questions left unanswered in Bostock, my office recently issued an advisory opinion concerning the use of preferred pronouns in the workplace. We determined that neither state nor federal law requires a coworker to use the preferred pronouns and name of a fellow employee and that an employer is likely not liable for a supposed misuse of pronouns. No federal court has reached and no reasonable, reasonable interpretation of Title VII would support a different conclusion. So in summary, as we continue to deal with the fallout of the Bostock decision, it is of the utmost importance that we address questions like this and give employers clarity about what the law requires. I am committed to ensuring that all workplaces in Indiana appropriately balance religious liberty, freedom of speech, safety, collegiality, and productivity. 
And Chairman, it's just an honor to be here and seeing my friends and colleagues again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I now recognize Mr. Berry for his opening statement. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, Chairman Comer, uh, Ranking Member Ocasio-Cortez, and members of the committee. My name is Jonathan Berry, and I'm the managing partner of the law and public policy strategy firm Boyd & Gray PLLC. There I provide strategic counsel and litigate on issues involving the overlapping bureaucracies of the administrative state and corporate America, including matters relating to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in the workplace. I want to thank you uh, for inviting me to, to testify today on the important subject of the recent overreach and underreach of the EEOC. I am honored to currently represent the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and other plaintiffs in litigation against the Commission regarding one of its recent rulemakings. While my views on the subject of today's hearing are informed by my representation of clients in this and other matters, I do not appear here today on behalf of any client and the views I present are my own. Um, uh, also, do honor to bring with me here my 10-year-old son, Simon, um, to witness the, the committee's important work. Um, uh, the Commission has an important and crucial role to play in protecting American workers from unlawful discrimination and advancing equal opportunity for all. Unfortunately, too often, the Commission currently is working against those objectives, creating the need for congressional oversight. Three problems stand out. Uh, when it comes to the EEOC's treatment of race. First, it has defended DEI initiatives in the workplace, but those initiatives often violate Title VII. So-called reverse discrimination is unlawful discrimination under Title VII. When corporations make recruiting, training, management, and hiring decisions that treat non-white employees preferentially on the basis of race, those initiatives are generally unlawful. Yet, the EEOC has let this discrimination go largely unpoliced, necessitating a surge in private lawsuits. Um, second, um, the Commission has uh, shoot, sued an employer, in this case the Sheets gas station chain, under Title VII's disparate impact provision for merely performing criminal background checks. But Title VII's disparate impact provision is likely unconstitutional, and the EEOC uses this powerful weapon inconsistently in any event. When the Commission employs this powerful tool arbitrarily, it becomes impossible for employers to plan around or predict how the law will be enforced. And third, the EEOC has continued to require that all employers uh, submit workforce demographic data uh, that breaks their employees down by race above a certain employer size. But it is wrong to require employers to classify their employees into racial categories and report the results absent particularized su suspicion of discrimination. It encourages everyone involved, the government, the employer, and the employee, to evaluate the merits of a human being on racial terms. So accordingly, I have three oversight recommendations for the committee to consider. consider. First. <clears throat> The Commission must be held to account for declining to stamp out racially discriminatory DEI programs. For instance, one firm alone that we sometimes work with, America First Legal, has filed over 30 discrimination charges against gigantic companies like Disney and Salesforce and IBM, whose DEI programs are facially discriminating on the basis of race. This committee could follow up, if it chose, to demand explanation for the lack of prompt EEOC action on these charges. Um, second, the EEOC must be held to account for how it sets its enforcement priorities. Particularly, with regard to disparate impact liability, the Commission could bring suit against almost any employer selection procedure. Why has the EEOC targeted criminal background checks and not college degree requirements, which often have profound disparities that result? The Commission should be asked that question. And third, and finally, Congress should end the EEO-1 data collection, or at least limit its imposition to cases where the Commission has particularized suspicion. There is no need to continue this extremely broad data collection, and its racial classification mandate forces American employers to view their employees as members of racial categories and not simply as individual human persons possessing dignity given by God. Thank you again for the chance to testify this morning. Thank you. I now recognize Ms. Stepman for her opening statement. 
Distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to testify at today's much needed hearing. I currently serve as senior policy and legal analyst with Independent Women's Forum and Independent Women's Law Center. For almost 30 years, IWF has been the leading national women's organization dedicated to enhancing women's freedom and well being. Americans overwhelmingly agree that employers should be forbidden by law from discriminating on the basis of race and sex. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 enshrined this principle into law. But is this fundamental promise of the civil rights era, the colorblind workplace, uh, being fulfilled by today's interpretation and enforcement of Title VII? I would argue that unfortunately in many respects it's not. Under the guise of progress or trying to rectify past wrongs, Title VII and its enforcement have gone from protecting the colorblind workplace to undermining it. And I want to talk today about three ways in which that's happening. Um, as the chairman said in his opening remarks, the EEOC is mostly looking the other way thus far um, on overt racial discrimination when it's defended on the basis of diversity or inclusion or similar rationales. Nobody actually really disputes legally that Title VII forbids taking into account race or sex in employment decisions. Um, the EEOC spends much of its 2,000 employees' efforts on policing, hiring, firing, or training criteria that even the commission itself admits include no intent to discriminate. Um, so more on that in a moment. Yet it's shockingly common, as we've seen from this testimony, um, that, that for huge corporations to implement programs that amount to the kind of blatant racial quota setting that would make even Harvard University blush, these violations are advertised proudly. Executives in banking, technology, and consulting came forward in 2020 to promise to hire a concrete quota of 100,000 black, Latino, and Asian workers in the next decade. Companies like Google and Adidas declared to the press that 30% of their new positions would be filled by black or Latino workers by 2025. In 2020, at the height of the BLM movement, much of corporate America made obviously discriminatory promises like these, and there's evidence that they followed through on those promises. Of the 300,000 jobs edit added by the S&P 100 in the year following the summer of 2020, 94% of them went to people of color. Using the EEOC's favorite tool, disparate impact, there can be no doubt then that the discrimination pendulum in America's biggest companies has swung past equality and meritocracy towards discriminating against employees who are white, male, or lack other favored characteristics. But in this case, it's combined with clear statements of discriminatory intent. Unlike in the education context where soft racial preferences but never quotas were allowed prior to being struck down by, uh, by students for fair admissions, making decisions even partially based on race was never permissible in the employment context, yet companies had no fear about bragging about these hard quotas. While Commissioner Andrea Lucas has sounded the alarm about these violations, Title VII's anti-discrimination mandate, um, the, the EOC as a whole has been oddly quiet about these clear violations. Uh, the EOC does have a responsibility to protect women from sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace, but in an April 2024 guidance, the commission does the opposite by redefining sex to include gender identity in a way that denies female employees their rights, privacy, and safety. Um, the guidance explicitly states that employers who do not provide access to single-sex spaces on the basis of gender identity will be in violation, forcing women to use the restroom, pump breast milk, and even in some cases change or shower with male colleagues as a condition of employment. As the preeminent legal organization dedicated to preserving the common sense biological definition of sex, the Independent Women's Law Center has already received inquiries from women who have already been subjected to the results of this confusion and redefinition, now encouraged by the EEOC. One woman who contacted us works with chemicals that require employees to shower at work every day. The employer allowed a male to shower with the women on the basis of proclaimed gender identity. That female employees were uncomfortable with this accommodation was largely disregarded, of course. Um, another woman who contacted us tours with concerts, often in venues with group showers. Here too, a man with male genitals was accommodated on, uh, with access to the female showers. Even when the women tried to delay their own showers, inconvenience themselves to avoid him in the shower, the male employee waited in order to shower alongside them. Unbelievably, in the age of microaggressions and firing over mild jokes or offhand remarks, um, a man waiting to watch his female colleagues uh, shower is now actually encouraged, not prohibited by the EEOC. The EEOC does not have the power to rewrite protected categories of Title VII, and their invented definition of the word sex in the statute is creating exactly the kind of workplace harassment the Commission is supposed to prevent. 
If a male employee repeatedly showing his penis uh, to unwilling female coworkers does not qualify as sexual harassment under Title VII, it's honestly hard to see what kind of workplace behavior would. American workers want to be judged by their employers on the basis of the quality and the, their credentials and work, not skin color or sex. Title VII's protections against discrimination and harassment should be enforced sanely, fairly, and without choosing favored or disfavored classes. Um, reforms should be made to rein in out-of-control interpretations contrary to the plain text of law, um, returning Title VII to its original, textual, and worthy purpose. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Ms. Wiley for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Comer, uh, Ranking Member Ocasio-Cortez, and members of this committee. My name is Maya Wiley, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm the proud president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, we will enter our 75th year next year, and we are the civil rights coalition that is responsible for fighting for and helping pass every single civil rights law you just heard the ranking member mention in her opening statement. I say that because we have a 74-year history, both of standing and fighting for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 when it faced a 60-day filibuster in the Senate, 60 days, the longest filibuster in the history of the United States Senate. And ever since then, we have had to link arms across the most diverse coalition in the country that looks like a majority of the country, that has most major religious faiths, that has labor, that has educators, that has everyone. And we have linked arms to ensure and, and continue to protect the gains we have made. And one of the things I just want to acknowledge is that we all here agree that discrimination is wrong. And that is exactly why we know diversity, equity, and inclusion, a creation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, who we commemorate in its 60th year this year, helped create. I want to underscore that D-E-N-I, diversity, equity, inclusion, has been made divisive despite the fact that a majority in this country and businesses have embraced it because it's good for the bottom line as well as advancing equal opportunities for everyone. And I just want to remind all of us that it is Jamie Dimon the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, who himself referred to himself as a self-described, red-blooded, unwoke capitalist who is standing by diversity, equity, and inclusion because it's good for business. And the reality of what we're seeing is not a violation of Title VII. In fact, what the EEOC has done is continue to enforce Title VII, and it continues to be and remain the law of this land. And what we have to remember, too, is not only is it good for the workforce, is it good for business, is it good for the gross domestic product, is it good for a joint and shared prosperous future, it is that we have compelling need to continue to identify barriers to equal opportunity for all people. And it is Jamie Dimon himself who pointed to in a recent interview the example of how by having the way to identify, and he mentioned two black employees he did not feel good about losing, and why they were not promoted. And it was the ability to identify the barriers that made him say, we can't keep losing good people. And everything he has done is in compliance with the law. And we have a lot of reason to be deeply concerned about fear-mongering over what is working. 
because it is. And let me give you a few examples of just how this is good for everyone, because it is. Because when women challenged height requirements for police departments, there were 10% of applicants who were white men who didn't meet them. And thanks to those challenges, more white men who were short got jobs they had been precluded from. And as we continue to see all of the evidence around how we still see discrimination against people of color, against women of all races, and yes, against transgender Americans, we say we all deserve dignity, we all deserve diversity, we all benefit from it, and if we're not about inclusion in this country, what are we about? Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your opening statements. Votes have been called. So uh, the committee will recess until 10 minutes after the close of the final vote in this morning series, which I expect to be around 10 minutes after 12. With that, the committee stands in recess.